Okay, and we are live. Hi, everybody. And hello to Professor Noah Askin from the University of California at Irvine. Hi, hi, Mel. Nice to be here. And I am, yeah, and I am Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. And we're going to have a very special interview today because we're going to talk about what makes everything special, what makes memorable books, what makes memorable popular songs. Hey, we might even talk about perfumes. So, Noah, welcome to the show. This is the first time that uh, we're talking about picture books, but we're branching out into what makes a popular anything. And you're an, you're an expert in popularness. So what makes a popular anything? Uh, first, Mel, thank you for having me. It's uh, nice to be here chatting with you. Glad you found me from across across the ocean and continents it, it, and, and no, internet. No, it's impossible. It's impossible not to find you. Uh, your TEDx talk on what makes a popular popular song has been seen and listened to by 161,000 people, among them me. And uh, I've been looking for you for years. I actually teach your thoughts in my courses on popular music. But oh, today wow. we're going to we're going to segue from children's books to music and back talking about what makes popular anything. So go ahead. What makes it popular anything? Sure. Uh, not to start off with too difficult a question, right? Um, well, you know, I, these days especially, I think you've got an interesting world into which products and and pieces of culture enter because of the nature of access that's provided by everyone being connected all the time, you, what you have is you have a handful of products, no matter whether we're talking about songs or movies or books or television shows, a handful that have become very, very, very popular. And then kind of everything else it struggles to break out of its niche. And every once in a while, you'll have things that do. But for the most part, you, you have this kind of very small group of things that achieve lots of popularity and everything else is, is the long tail, as they say. Um, and, and, you know, what goes into making something popular now? Well, things like large marketing budgets, things like being, having a marketable name and being already successful, those things matter. Um, having a strong social media following that those things help. But really what, what I found in my research is that what, at least from songs perspective, what makes them stand out is something called optimal differentiation. Uh, amongst popular songs, having something unique that makes a song stand out to some extent, but not so much that it alienates large parts of an audience, right? So optimally distinct, what does that mean? Optimal means that there's some right point that's going to make something stand out and distinct or optimal differentiation, something that makes it a little bit different from what's out at the time and what it's competing with. Um, and, you know, Intuitively, I think we probably hear that and go, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but it's nice to actually be able to show that that's the case uh, empirically as well. And so things that are have some degree of uniqueness to them, some degree of novelty, but not too much are the ones that that tend to be the best. Okay, do you, do you believe that that holds for anything, uh, perfumes, toothpastes, um, uh, shampoos, uh, which I don't use anymore, um, and the children's books? Uh, I would say cultural items, yes. Um, consumer goods, I don't know as much. I haven't given a huge amount of thought to consumer goods, although I suspect that's going to be the case, right? Because if, if something just is, if a particular product category is generally undifferentiated, then you're just competing on price. Uh, and so what's going to make something stand out is some sort of, of aspect of novelty to it, whatever that might mean in per, from a perfumes perspective, from a shampoo perspective, from a toothpaste perspective. Otherwise, you're just purely competing on what's the least expensive. Um, now, when it comes to cultural items and books and songs and movies and, and television shows and uh, things like that, I think that, that this absolutely will hold because, you know, we humans tend to be novelty seeking, but only to a point. Right, we we become desensitized to think the same thing over and over again, and we lose our interest. And so people think that, oh, I just want this thing that I like a lot. But what happens is the the value and the enjoyment you get from doing the same thing over and over again diminishes over time. And so you seek some degree of novelty, regardless of what it is that you're looking for. Uh, and so that's going to drive 
success among products of all varieties, not necessarily consumer products, but of cultural products that's going to drive the success is having that some degree of novelty that's going to make it interesting and, and relatively unique to a given consumer. Okay, so you can you can make a uh, this argument for many different kinds of products. Um, and I would extend your reach from culture to practically anything consumer related. Um, and um, so I, I'm thinking, let's go back to children's books. So every, at every stage you have gatekeepers. So in a, in a popular song, you have your gatekeepers, uh, the music companies and all of the people on the way. And in, in children's books, you have the agents and the, and the publishing houses and the editors and uh, then how much money they're gonna put into marketing. Okay, but we have to assume that they, they're guessing uh, on stories uh, or songs, I'm gonna argue afterwards if it's the same thing, that, um, that, that can succeed, that they have a feel that they're gonna be, be, be successful. And you're saying that they want, you want them to be similar and yet a bit different. And in our previous conversation, you said to me, well, okay, but we don't know exactly what that difference is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and this is where, so there's there's a famous line from a famous, it's an academic paper. So, uh, you know, how famous could it actually be? But the, from um, a paper in the nineties that basically it was interviewing um, movie producers. And one of the producers that was interviewed basically said, all hits are flukes, right? And it's because, you know, people have a sense People have a sense, but they don't know. They don't know what's going to latch on. They don't know where that point of novelty or differentiation is going to come from. And so what, when you say that there are these gatekeepers, which first of all, the gatekeepers are being, their power is being somewhat diminished. It depends on the industry and the genre and whatever. But you know, the internet is kind of the great equalizer in terms of content production. Um, but I think that sense that you talk about is a feeling of like, okay, I've seen this before and I know that this sells, so that's good, but it's enough, it's got something enough novelty to it that, okay, I think we can market this because people don't just want the exact same things over and over again, although the Marvel movie franchise may suggest otherwise. Um, but, but I think that sense that you talk about is that gatekeeping of trying to find some degree of differentiation. Now, is it optimal? I don't know. Uh, but when you've got gatekeepers with power, they can sort of push that on on consumers in a way of saying, yeah, we know that the, you know Harry Potter, when it came out at that point in time, was pretty novel, I would argue. And then since then, you've seen lots and lots of serialized stories in that kind of genre and in other genres, too. And it's not that serialized stories didn't exist before. They just were never, none of them achieved the fame and success that Harry Potter did. And you could argue that few since have achieved that, but they, that became a thing for sort of young adult reading for a while and, and really like adult reading uh, for a while that this became very popular. And so we're going to try to find something that follows a similar pattern, similar style, but has some degree of novelty. So it's not just children wizards over and over again. That, 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 cannot be predicted according to your quote. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to know. Look, you can maximize, you can try to maximize give and, and take a shot that's gonna give you better odds. But at the end of the day, you you don't, you never know. And that that's why you're seeing, that's one of the reasons you're seeing, at least in movie production, a lot of these, these um, franchises because you can bank on them. Now, are they going to necessarily set records in terms of like, artistry and things like that? No, but that you know that they're going to sell enough to be- Hold on, to, hold on, to Noah, reasonably well. just, just two years ago, my, my hero, Steven Spielberg, um, he uh, produced a uh, remake of uh, one of the most favorite movies of all time, West Side Story. Mm -hmm. And it was similar and it was different and it was more colorful and it was more authentic and it wasn't such a commercial success. Yeah, right. Big, I mean, I think, so part of the reason is the genre that it's in. Musicals, as a general rule, tend not to be the most popular overall, although that, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda would like to say something about that. Um, but I think that you know, it, it was because it's a direct take, right? It's just a remake. And yes, it's much more stylized. It was beautifully shot. I actually saw that. I don't see that many movies, but I saw that one. Um, and and it updated to some extent, right? 
but again, because it's almost a near replica, the, the novelty that was introduced was pro was not enough. You, you would think that, that a guy that produced E.T. and the other uh, smash hits uh, and is about my age uh, would have more seichel uh, than to waste a few hundred million dollars on something that he might have known wouldn't succeed commercially. Uh, but let's, I don't want to go into movies because I, I, I know nothing about movies except Casablanca and we'll get to, to that. But uh, let's talk to you uh, about children's books. You have uh, two small children. Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you read to them? I know, but I want everybody else to know. Sure. So, so the the two what, what you had asked me previously when we were talking about this was was you know what have have I brought anything from my childhood and and sort of force fed them that uh, and two books in particular come to mind. One is Where the Wild Things Are, which is not. Well, a, I did well, uh, no, I didn't ask you. I asked you what are your favorite books for, uh, to read your children. Fair enough. Okay. Fair, so I you're I took the nostalgia now, angle. My, my new friend, you're coming clean. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so I did take at least on the, on these two I took the nostalgia angle. Um, Where the wild things are uh, is the first one. Again, not a particularly controversial choice uh, at this point. And then a book by an author called Daniel Pinkwater um, called The Big Orange Splot. Um, and that was something my mother read to me uh, and my sister growing up. And the the basic plot, if I can give it in in thirty seconds, is. Um, the Mr. Plumbean, the main character, lives on a street that they call a neat street. All the houses look exactly the same, and everybody likes it that way. And then uh, Deus Ex Machina, uh, Seagull drops a can of orange paint on Mr. Plumbean's house, and rather than go back and sort of make it uniform like everything else, he decides one night to kind of redo his whole house in an explosion of color and vision of his dreams and and sort of revealing of his personality. And the people on the street get angry. They try to one by one. They try to come talk him out of it. And one by one, he convinces them to to redo their homes in their own personality and dreams and explosions of color and 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 interest and interests. Um, and so this, that's this that's a good a kind, one. This is a kind of a metaphor for for what we're talking about. It's like a a meta story here. Uh, yeah. So it's there a story of being the same but different, right? Yeah, right. Living on the same street and deciding to break out of it. Uh, although I would argue that it's not optimal. This is quite differentiated um, in the way that they do it in the story. But but yes, so, I think so, a good. So 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 is his house. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So a, a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, where the wild things are is a bit controversial. I mean, it's one of the most famous picture books ever. Um, but that's not to say it isn't a bit controversial. Um, and it is, uh, at least for its time, it was probably similar, but very different. Yeah, uh, probably, although it followed, it, it looked, a not, right, the, uh, the, the um, illustrations are beautiful, but in terms of the format, right, it's a picture book, not a lot of words, um, a lot of run-on sentences, if you've had a look at it recently. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it fits the style if the themes are, and especially at that time, were quite controversial, right? No, on I, its surface, I, I, it I, I, I love this discussion. I'm going to interject a bit because this is so much fun. Um, so actually, there's a, Morris Sendak has a ruse here. He has something going. He says, mm -hmm. this is going to be your regular, ordinary, off-the-shelf... Oops, it's not. So... Maybe there's a thing to lure the reader into this is going to be exactly the same. And then, oh, did I say it was going to be the same? No, I'm sorry. It's quite different. I, I hope you like it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, right, because if it had advertised itself as being particularly subversive, uh, which at, certainly when it was released, it was that too differentiated. And so that the the similarity is in first appearances, right? Where the wild things are is not necessarily a controversial, maybe it was then, I don't know, but it was not necessarily a controversial title for a children's book. And at the beginning, right, it, you very quickly realize, wait a second, this isn't, this isn't usual, but it looks like it. And it's got drawings of monsters. If you're just kind of thumbing through the book, looks it's, close it's, enough. It's, 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 it's one of the most loved uh, children's books ever. And it's controversial, just like the Bible is. There's nothing wrong. Yeah. Would be controversial. Uh huh. No, so, I agree. and so, that's but, what makes it interesting. Yeah. So, but this is this is this is interesting. You've chosen. You chose. I didn't ask you, Noah. I want you to tell me about a few books that, that your parents read to you when you were five. 
and, and you made this choice. So nostalgia is also a factor, but your parents chose out of the thousands of books to read these two to you, the same mm -hmm. way that my late father read Madeline to me when I was a kid, and that's been imprinted for the last 65 years. Yep, yep. Roald Dahl, Madeline? No, Madeline, it looks like Ben oh, no. The French, we're at the wait, French, the French or Belgian. Wait, yes, I, I know. I, I'm like, I, I could be, I could be your grandfather. Um, <laughs> so way before your time. So um, let's, uh, let's go back to now to, to what you were saying about being similar and being a bit different. Uh, and I was, we were talking about a uh, Bob Dylan who was criticized for, um, for uh, riffing off a, a folk songs. And um, there's a famous uh, TED talk about that. Uh, and your thoughts, please. Sure. So, I mean, I think that's how, how, how do you start? How do you know what's sufficiently similar and sufficiently different until you have a real understanding of, of the genre or the industry or the, you know, the area you're performing in? And, and so I think, right, so you look at Dylan as kind of a classic example um, who, who talked about like good artists borrow and great artists steal. I have an author that I really like, Austin Cleon, who has a book called Steal Like an Author, I uh, Steal Like an Artist. Um, and, you know, I think starting out by really, really digging into what's already in existence and somehow taking that and learning it and making it your own is how you actually come to understand what is sufficiently similar and what is sufficiently different to actually stand out. And, and if you think about the creative process, we know enough about the creative process at this point to be able to teach people a lot about how to be creative individually and in groups. The hardest thing I think to develop in the creative process and the creative production process is taste, is knowing what's good, what's not good, what's sufficiently similar, what's sufficiently differentiated. And the only way you come to develop that taste, I think, is by immersing yourself in what exists and so you've got Dylan, who spent the early part of his career really just becoming one with the folk canon. You've got the Beatles, who played for years at the Cavern Club, really digging into American rock and blues for years. I mean, and they played for hours and hours a day for years. And only then, when they fully have kind of immersed themselves and internalized it, and then started to make it their own. Now they have a sense of taste and this understanding of this is good, this is not as good, this is similar, this is differentiated, right? And so that that familiarity that comes from taking the past and making it your own is how you start to develop taste. Okay, but but um, that that worked for the Beatles, um, and then they went off on their own tangent, you know, uh, Revolver and the. And Sergeant Pepper, and um, I remember as a kid listening to Sergeant Pepper and thinking to myself, well, at the beginning, what happened to the Beatles? Mm -hmm. You can't dance to this music. This is not similar to what they've done. This is weird. I, it later became weird and wonderful for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Comments. So I, first of all, I, I mean, Sergeant Peppers didn't appear in a vacuum, right? You have Revolver and Rubber Soul coming before that, and that was the those were the first. And lot, you know, lots of Beatles fans and and critics and, and historians point to those albums as kind of that's the big shift, right? Is is when those two came out because that was the transition from doing this kind of more British invasion. Let's take kind of. Uh, rock and blues and kind of make it our own to now we're going to get a little bit more experimental. Um, and so that transition, so Sgt. Pepper's is, is kind of evolutionary in that perspective, from that perspective, though, as a young listener, you may have found it to be revolutionary for better and for worse. Um, yeah, and so way, I, I, I give, I, I give a course on sixties music, which is called the, the evolution of the revolution. <laughs> so good. I, 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 never I, thought, I didn't know I also that. Teach, I also teach them the transition. Uh, that the Beatles went through um, with the uh, Rubber Soul and, and Revolver. Uh, mm -hmm. But this just came to me while we were talking, that those albums were different and they were new, but Sgt. Pepper was, oy vey, this is really, wah, what is this? Um, but let, let's go back to your previous uh, thing about um, creative people you mentioned in our previous discussion, um, connecting the unexpected. Take mm -hmm. me there, please. So, right, if you if you talk about needing some degree of optimal differentiation, 
right? Knowing what's similar to what's out there or has existed before, that's pretty easy. That differentiation is where it becomes harder. And, and you know, there's the, the cliche, there's nothing new under the sun. And that's generally true. Nothing is very completely novel. Something is coming from pre-existing things. And the question is, well, then how do you introduce novelty? If there's nothing new, well, it's creating connections that didn't exist previously and drawing, drawing a line between two things where a line did not previously exist. And that's the nature of novelty and creativity is not just drawing connections where they didn't exist before, but having an understanding of why that that's meaningful and putting it into your, your as an artist's own style, own perspective. And so if you think about Sgt. Pepper's, right, it was, it was, um, an album that basically started to draw connections between, uh, you know, it's trying to tell a story, trying to make up the, this, the narrative across an album, which they weren't necessarily the first to do it, but they were the first to do it in this style as it was evolving. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I love you. I, where have you been my whole life? So this is, Around? It's, it's, not, it's not only art. Mm -hmm. It's also invention and it's science. Yeah. And it's what I call for my students thinking between the boxes. And, and yeah. you're saying something really, really um, illuminating. I sound like a, um, a uh, the, the opera ghost um, <laughs> for a little illumination. Um, uh -huh. So you're saying that it's not only connecting the boxes, I call this thinking between the boxes, mm -hmm. um, but it's like finding the, the two boxes to connect. You call this a matter of taste. Well, it's a combination of, it's, it's a combination of exposure because you have to know that these boxes exist in the first place. And so this is why being super, super narrowly focused on anything is important at the beginning, but then you have to branch out. And this is why, for example, a liberal arts education is so valuable because it provides all these different boxes. It's why developing hobbies is so valuable because it creates the world of boxes that you can now start to draw connections between. Yes. And so, so it's exposure and then it's taste because just knowing that these two things are disconnected is not enough. Oh, I'm gonna connect these two random disconnects. Well, why aren't they connected? Is it because nobody's done it before because they've never had, had those two boxes in mind or is it because they don't go well together? Or is it because they don't have an intuitive understanding of how to connect them in a way that's going to connect with an audience or, or user or listener or viewer? Okay. So, um, yeah, but you, I think you're giving, this is how inventions work, but there's a, two other elements. Uh, mm -hmm. And one other element, one of the elements is what you call the fluke. Mm -hmm. You know, like saccharin was invented by the scientist who was doing something else and then tasted his finger for some reason and said, hey, what's going on? But you have to be able to go back and say, hey, you know, there's a connection here between these two boxes. Yeah. And someone has to be able to connect it. So the story of the post-it note, um, this sort of like apocryphal story of how the post-it note was connected or uh, created um, at 3M, uh, the guy who ultimately is credited with creating it, Arthur Fry, sang in like a church choir and had, you know, a book that he would sing had the, the song book that they would do on Sundays and, and during their choir practice. And he had basically torn pieces of paper that went in the book. And, and every by the end of every Sunday practice, the paper would be all over the floor. And at 3M, they have this process of sharing what's going on, these technical councils that they're called. And there was a, a scientist there who was trying to make the world's strongest adhesive and it wasn't going very well. And Arthur Fry happened to see this and say, wait, this adhesive that actually isn't great might make sense in this context, right? And because he was in a church choir and was used to pieces of paper falling out of his so, book. So, 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 let's, so, so let's summarize so far. If you want to be a great inventor, uh, sing in a church choir. <laughs> no, it's identify the problems that you face oh. in your everyday life and look into the other realms for solutions. No, I, I, I'm an inventor and I, and I don't know any inventors that really think like that. Uh, but, but they do have a, a multi channels of interests and uh, this being able to connect, you know, where have I seen that before? Where can I, what can I do with that? Um, not necessarily, hmm, let's see, global warming. How can I fix that? Um, that kind of brainstorming in my experience doesn't work. 
Uh, the flux dudo. Let's go back now. You talked about the story. You talked about the story of Sergeant Pepper. And you talked about the apocryphal uh, story of Dr. Fry. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, I'm, I'm not sure that, that the uh, stick it notes were really, were really uh, developed like that. But right. that's one. Exactly. I, I said, as the story goes, the apocryphal yeah. no, story, right? I, I, I'm, not really, I'm not really sure that God uh, woke up Abraham some morning and said, you know, get your mule and take your son and so on. Uh, I wasn't there. I'm, it might have happened, but it's one hell of a story. Exactly. And yep. the post-it are, are a story. And, and, and popsicles probably were not really invented by this 10-year-old kid, but it doesn't matter. It's a story. Sounds and children's good. books are stories. So now we're going to segue into what I think. And I think that being similar and a little bit different um, is, is fine. But I want to challenge you now uh, with the story element. Mm -hmm. Because um, when you look at recent songs, okay, um, then being a little, being similar and different to what's out there now sounds very cogent. And is cogent a word? Mm -hmm. It is. Yep. Okay. Uh, it is now. Uh, but what happens uh, when you look at songs, movies, uh, perfumes, children's books, as you do, that are 40 or 60 or 80 or 100 years old, the ones that have survived um, generations and are not, you know, Blue Moon, which was written in 1933 or 1934 by Rogers and Hart, is not similar to any hip hop or any modern uh, uh, pop songs, but it's, it's sung in jazz clubs and um, in football stadiums, soccer stadiums to you uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. So what, what really interests me uh, because of my age and the course that I give on popular music going back 50 or 100 years is what makes something so wonderful that even though the genres have changed and the dances have changed, people are still singing and reading uh, and you can uh, invoke your children's books. And I wish you would when you answer this question. Sure. Um... That, look, that's a tough question. I think, first of all, it has to have stood out at it in its own time or have been reassessed at some point in the future to have stood out for a particular reason, right? And so because this is actually a project I'm, I'm in discussions with one of my former colleagues from INSEAD, which is where I spent the last eight years in, in France, about how creative reassessment takes place because creativity is as much about the creation itself as the way it gets assessed. Um, and so things that stand out at a given point in time may or may not be known. They may not pop up on anyone's radar. Well, but one second, let, let, let's, let's mention Thomas Kuhn here. Yeah, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. be because what you're saying is that the, the invention or the song or the movie or the children's book has to be acknowledged by peers at some mm -hmm. later stage. Yep. Right. And, and the whole paradigm shift, which is what he talks about, is what allows you to then go back. And, and reassess and say, actually, this was quite creative and either didn't get its due or not enough people knew of it. And so it didn't get plucked and, and sort of then dragged into the, into the mainstream uh, or into the popular imagination. But I think, so it has to have stood out at some point in its time or been sort of ex post designated as having stood out. And then look, there's a perpetuation, right? Once something reaches, reaches a certain level of popularity and repetition, we then subject future generations to it. And if you're exposed, right, there's the mere exposure effect in psychology, which says the more that you're exposed to something, the more you like it to a point. After a while, you then desensitize and sort of and, and it becomes less interesting, but it becomes new to other people. And so, look, if we expose you to Blue Moon a thousand times in some sort of like clockwork orange type, uh, you know, experiment, at first you're going to like it and then eventually it becomes torture. Um, but I think over time, new, as new people and new generations get exposed to it, it continues to exist. And so I, would, I, don't, I don't, haven't looked into this in particular and this particular phenomenon, but I would think that you have something that stands out in its time, enough people like it that it becomes canon, right? It becomes something that everybody has to learn as, as part of their enculturation process or as part of their training if they're becoming musicians. 
And then enough people are subjected to it over time that it kind of takes on a life of its own and becomes just something that gets perpetuated. And enough people get exposed each generation that it continues to live on. But, but Noah, I, I'm going to take you back to the to the great uh, songwriters of the uh, of the age that I love best, the 20s to the 40s, uh, Gershwin and Jerome Kern and Frank Lesser and uh, Harold Arden. Um, you know, Gershwin, the Gershwins wrote hundreds of songs, but only several dozen are, are known and recognized today. Um, if everybody knows, let's say, Summertime. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you, I still have to ask myself, given everything that you've said, um, it, don't you believe that there's something in these old songs out of the zillions and millions, um, given the marketing and the covers and whatever, that they have some intrinsic value? Doesn't Casablanca, the movie, have an intrinsic value? Doesn't Where the Wild Things Are have an intrinsic value uh, that made it keep reverberating in our collective minds? Sure, but I, I'm sure that there were other songs that had intrinsic value to them that came out at the same time or similar books that didn't reach that level of popularity, right? And so you talk about the about Gershwin in particular, right? Why mm. does he have a dozen or 20 songs that continue to be done over and over? Well, because people keep performing his shows, but, but also, you know, because creating something creative and that resonates is hard. And so you're taking a little bit of a shotgun approach. And back to my point earlier, all hits are flukes. Why those 12 or 20? It has okay. nothing to do. We know, we know that the, the skill that, that Gershwin or other songwriters who have continued to have their songs or, or stories persist have the skill. Okay, so then why these 12? Well, something in the selection process and then the fact that they latch on because of the way they resonate, because they have some intrinsic value, then allows them to perpetuate. But, you know, I'm sure that there were dozens, if not hundreds of other songs that could have as well in terms of pure artistry and resonance. But it was something about Gershwin. It was something about his shows. It was something intrinsic that this. And so it's a confluence of factors. Yeah, yeah. But when, when all of these songs are from shows, mm -hmm. they're from movies and shows and so on. But the, the songs stand out and some of them even, you know, outlast the movies um, I, you're going to be challenged to tell me what movie Cheek to Cheek is from. Um, oh okay, so but but um, I'm so now I'm going to challenge you with my theory, and this theory sure. is now going to be uh, Mel's challenge to Noah, uh, and we're going to segue back to children's stories and the reason that you picked those two stories at the beginning of our conversation, which yeah. I didn't know. Okay. So um, a few years ago, I, I decided to give a, a, an academic course on what makes some songs popular, so popular that the genres and the dances and the people and, and everybody who sang them was dead and, and, and they're still there. Dream a little dream of me from the early 30s. And you're going to say, yeah, because Mama Cass sang it in the 60s. With, and, and then I'm going to say, yeah, and, and, and what about a, um, I'm a believer. And you're going to say to me, yeah, because it was covered in Shrek. And I'm going to say to you, no, Noah, it's, it, it, there's something intrinsic in those songs. And the first time I gave this course, we took all of your parameters and everybody else's parameters. We studied 30 different parameters. I don't have the ability that you do to do this analysis. I, wa I want to challenge you now to do this. Um, and and then I'm going to talk a little bit because this has been bothering me for like five years. Uh, a student said to me, Mel, it's all about the chords. If you have a song with four chords, it's going to last forever. And I said, oh, no. Because a lot of famous songs with four chords, you know, like, oh, Carol, Lion by the Fool. Even the bridge has four chords, right? And uh, it's the one, six, two, five that we all know. And that's how to have. And then I say to him, no, no, you don't understand, but that's one out of a hundred thousand zillion one six two five songs. Mm -hmm. Why do we sing O Carol, 60 years old? And I said, okay, I'm gonna show you. So I, I thought, what where can I where can I find a song with 20 chords? So I remembered a song from the early 70s, Alone Again Naturally. Mm -hmm. Which is by love, by love. Huh? By love? By love. No, it, it's by um. Uh, in a little while from now, if I'm not feeling any less sour, by uh, Gilbert O'Sullivan. 
Oh, okay. There is a song alone again by a band called. It's anyway. okay. This goes back to the <laughs> early seventies. Um, Got it. I'm surprised you don't know it, but uh, but a lot of people know it, right? And alone again, naturally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and and I brought in this chord, this song with twenty different chords, maybe seventeen. I said to myself, okay, what's what's in this song? And then all of my experience and everything behind me said to me, hey, you have to think between the boxes here. What makes a song immortal is the story. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned this about seven times. I didn't want to stop you. You mentioned it when you talked about the Beatles and you mentioned it when you talked about Maurice Sendak. And I'm going to make the premise that what makes an anything popular over time is either the story it tells or the story it is. And so maybe it's not that much of a flu. I'm going to add to that. So I think it is story, but it's the story to you. It's the story to you, the listener, because it's not just about, right? Because again, this is taking, it's a song that people knew and there are lots of songs that lots of people know, but why is it that some persist? Well, because it's an, it's popular enough. It's in the collective conscious at a given point in time that it then has resonance for you. And so you then play it for your kids or your students or whoever, and you tell your story around it. So it's not just the story of the song. It's not just the story of the creation. Sorry, it's not just the story that's in the song. And it's not the story about how it was created. It's your connection to it. And so that wow. emotional resonance, that emotional resonance then gets not, that means that you're going to expose other to others to it and it's going to resonate with them. Oh, because oh, Mel told me about wow, this song wow, that was wow. so meaningful. So I, said, I, I forgot to give credit to the person who had the original idea. I stole the idea. It's a researcher called Henia, uh, who, oh, who, yeah. said that, uh -huh. who said that, you know, you can talk about the melody and the chords, but essentially it's a story. A lot of songs, you know, don't have words uh, mm -hmm. or they're in Greek and we still love them or French. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and so what you're telling me is huge. And this is what I was hoping was going to happen in our conversation. Because this is all about a, a, a stories, children's books, any kind of book. What Harold Underdown taught me about reader response. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to you. So you love reading your children two books that have a wonderful story. And the story resonated with you. And now you're sharing that story the same way that we share for the past 3,500 years, the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. Mm -hmm. Because there's something intrinsic to the story itself. There's something about the history that surrounds it, right? That makes it intriguing. Is it is it true? Is it not? We don't know. Here's what was created. Here's why. Here's how it was passed down, right? And then there's a connection of you, you know, you how you see yourself in that story, your connection to that story. We're all Abraham and we're all Isaac and we're all the sacrificial lamb or whatever, ram, sacrificial ram. <laughs> well, and, and, and even if not, even if you don't necessarily see yourself in that situation, you can, but you see your history in that story, whether your ancestor from an ancestral perspective or the connection to your, maybe your parents or your grandparents or your community. And so it's meaningful to you because of that, right? This is why religion is so powerful, not because the stories are universal, but because it's also a part of what you are exposed to when you're growing up and your connection to your parents, your community, your- But Noah, your what you're saying is that, is that universal is personal. Of course, of course, universal is personal. That's what makes it so, so compelling. That's what makes the best story so compelling. They are universal in terms of their resonance and yet can be personalized. Or the stories are very, very individualized and yet they speak to something that's universal. So. I, you know, I love the author, Michael Lewis, um, who wrote Moneyball and Liar's Poker, and he's had this incredible podcast. And what he does as well as anybody is take individual people and tell their stories. And in so doing, tells a story, a much broader story about an industry, about a trend, about a problem, whatever, about a phenomena, phenomenon. And, and what I find so amazing about the way he tells stories is that he's able to do this without beating you over the head of like, this is the major overarching theme that I'm trying to communicate to you. No, you don't have to do that. If you tell the personal really, really well, you'll be able to, to make that universal. Incredible. So um, 
we're, we have to sum up now because otherwise uh, we'll be here forever. I'm so happy I met you. This has been incredible. Um, yeah. So, so basically, if I want to be a successful children's author, and I do, um, mm -hmm. then a, my take from this wonderful conversation is not to be afraid to read as many children's books as I can, which we teach our students, uh, and not to be afraid not to copy them, but to riff on them a little bit. And that you say that that's kosher. Totally. I mean, think, think about like, you know, A Hero's Journey, Joseph Campbell, right? That's the overwhelming majority of every story is some subset or some riff on that. So if we've been doing that for you, and he has other archetypes, of course, too, but that's the primary one, right? That's every Star Wars movie that's made and continues to be popular. Um, you know, I, so taking things from existing stories, you, ca you can't not do that, right? It's, it's all been written about. And the question is, how do you take it and, and find that unique personal angle that and differentiates that, it and, and makes find it resonate? That so listen, uh, we're going to, in half a year, we're going to have a, another talk, if you will. Okay. And we're going to give this a little bit of time to percolate. And this has been wonderful. Noah, I called you Noah because that's your Hebrew name. It's okay. Noah Askin, uh, this has been uh, remarkable. Thank you very much. And this is going to go on the New Books Network because it's all been about creativity and books and stories. And it's been wonderful having you. And I'm also going to show it to my popular music students who are going to love you. Um, they might want to interview you. So listen, have a wonderful Hanukkah. And, uh, and uh, we have lots of stuff to, um, to assimilate here in a good sense. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks so Mel. much. Thanks it. so much. This is Mel Rosenberg the host of the Children's Book Network of the New Books Network. No, that was wrong. The, I'm host of the Children's Book, the Children's or whatever, and wishing everybody happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And Noah, thanks so much for being on the show. We'll talk later. Thanks, man. Take care. Bye. This was great. I don't know how to end it. Bye.